You're watching BBC World News. Work Life India is sponsored by Nexon EV. Cry the lightning. Hello, Namaste, and welcome to Delhi. I'm Devina, and this is Work Life India on the BBC, the show that looks at all things to do with money, the work we do, and the lives we lead. Now, India is a land of many majestic birds and animals, but rapid urbanization and deforestation are threatening many of them. As India hosts a major conference on the Convention of Migratory Wild Animals and Birds, we are asking how to say India's vanishing species. Now the Asian elephant, the great Indian bustard and the Bengal florican were added to the list of endangered birds and animals at the 13th meeting of the Conference of Parties to the Convention on Migratory Species just this week. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. Nearly 100 bird species are at high risk of extinction in India alone. To talk about it all, we have with us Latika Nath, who is a wildlife photographer and a biologist with interesting stories to share. And welcome, Latika. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Latika, you won't scare us with your stories on scorpions and snakes, but uh, help us bust <laughs> a lot of myths about uh, wildlife and wild animals. I shall try. <laughs> all right. Well, we also have uh, with us Ramesh Krishnamurti, who works at the Wildlife Institute of India. He's extensively worked with different policymakers. Welcome, Ramesh. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here. Well, 25 years of your journey, Ramesh, and <laughs> looking back at it, what made you switch your careers? No, I have not switched my career. I've been uh, in the wildlife field uh, ever since mm -hmm. I finished my master's. I think I come from a very rural background. I studied in one of the remotest area in Tamil Nadu. It's like this college called AVC College. In southern India. Southern India. But then landing at the Wildlife Institute and being here, I think it's a privilege for me. Okay. So my next guest is Aparna Rajgopalan, who has switched her career from being a lawyer to turning into a wildlife conservationist and now is the chairperson of Wildlife SOS. It's the organization you ring if you find a wild animal in your home, at least in Delhi. Uh, welcome, Aparna. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Thanks for calling me here, yeah. Well, well, Aparna, but before that, tell me, uh, what's the weirdest call that you have received? Uh, I think we've got many weird calls. Pythons in the Taj Mahal, civet cat in Parliament, Neil Guy on Rajpath. So, yeah, you get some really weird, uh, a leopard in a school in Bangalore. Oh, my God. Oh, and yeah. let's talk all about that. But pythons in Taj Mahal, <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, I think it, it requires a certain kind of courage to do what you guys are doing, and Latika, especially for you, because uh, in, in your profession of wildlife photography, uh, one of your most memorable photographs is of a puma. Uh, can you tell us about that, and when you took that photograph, you were just about three feet away from it? Yes, it's the most incredible experience. I was in uh, Chile recently, and I, was, um, I went there to, to meet and study puma. And I didn't realize that you could get quite so close to them. And we would leave early morning before dawn broke. And we would drive out into this mm. absolutely rugged, barren terrain and get out and walk, and walk straight up mountains. And it was very cold, minus 15 on some days. Oh, my God. And I met um, 17 Puma, 16 of which were really friendly. And this particular one walked right up to me and sort of almost checked me out to say, you know, <laughs> hey, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> You're oh a long God. way from home. So it was, it was quite an experience. You weren't scared at all? No. Oh, Not my God. And, and Ramesh, uh, tell me your experience. You actually work in sub-zero temperatures, and uh, you are also working with wildlife animals. You've had se certain similar experiences? I would rather uh, start by saying that uh, I think the forest area is much more safer to be than the places with the human. Therefore, ah. nothing to be scared or in the Delhi forest. Or Delhi with crazy traffic. <laughs> so I, I would say you. that, yes. see, I think animals generally give you warning, even if they won't attack mm -hmm. you. So therefore, mm -hmm. we are much more safer. Therefore, from that aspect, I think we are an excellent place to be working. We are privileged people. In fact, we feel it's really a privilege to be in the forest working for animals. So I worked, I come from a down south, it's a hot temperature. I worked in the mountain with, as you said, uh, sub-zero temperature. It's been an excellent journey. I think each place offers a lot of interesting things in terms of the animals, mm -hmm. in terms of the place, in terms of the people. 
I think India, as you know, it's an excellent diversity, both in terms of the landscapes and the people. Being so, one of the major hotspots of biodiversity. Uh, uh, but uh, Aparna, tell us that the three uh, species that we talked about in the beginning of the show, the Asian elephant, Bengal florican, and the great Indian bustard, uh, which are now on the endangered list for the United Nations body for CMS, the Convention of Migratory Species. But why is it important for us to talk about them? Why is it important for us to save them? Uh, uh, you can, you know, I mean, increasingly we can see that um, lots of species are vanishing. Mm -hmm. They're vanishing really fast, both habitat and uh, the animals. Uh, so I think uh, we need to talk about them because the, everything that we're doing today with, in terms of development, in the terms of infrastructure, the kind of railways or roadways or expressways or anything that we're building today, um, it's, it's growing so rapidly that habitat and animals are vanishing at a really, uh, you know, fast rate. So we have to talk about this. It's, a, it's actually an emergency, in my opinion, because uh, with vanishing habitats come it comes extinction. Absolutely. And also vanishing habitats means that, like you earlier mentioned, you'll have uh, uh, certain species like snakes or yes. even spotting of big cats yes. in cities yes. because that's, we've actually taken the habitat which yes. was earlier it's a, the it's jungle. A there's a conflict There's now. a conflict of human yes. and wildlife, but has it gone up in the recent years? It has because urban areas have expanded into rural areas. There's a merge between urban and rural areas in many places. Um, uh, forest areas are being fragmented. We aren't building enough corridors for them to cross from one area to the other. They cannot migrate. Mm. Uh, and also, when we talk of development, we are always talking about development. Uh, should it be development or should it be environment? I don't think that debate... But India is a developing economy. Yes. We do have housing needs for yes. our rising population. Where do we balance it, Ramesh? This is what Tana recently I would like to quote uh, Jane Goodall when she mm. said, uh, don't blame the human population growth blame it on the disproportionate wealth distribution. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to the development, yeah. it is not about the development as a whole, where we develop. I think there's so much of uh, exploitation of natural resources. Naturally, when you're trying to expand, it happens. But I think uh, it is a kind of a policy issue on level. Second is, I personally believe that conservation is a global responsibility it's and a global benefit. It's we think we are on the yes, top of the... It's also because we think we are the most important species. We are on top of the food yeah, chain. Yeah. But um, Latika, do we also need to see this, pro this entire uh, conversation in a cultural context? In India, for example, we do have also animal worshipping culture. We have tribes which have forever existed with uh, so many wildlife species. Absolutely, Divina. And don't forget we've got sacred forests. We've got um, lakes that are sacred, rivers which are sacred. Yeah. We've been brought up to respect nature. And I think the first God we ma worshipped was Mother Nature. So it's, it's something that's a part of us genetically even. And I think all Indians will relate to it regardless of caste, creed, religion, hmm. or fact, area yes, of the country. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I think she's so right because it's, it's not even just India. I think it's to do with any civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, any ancient civilization around the world worship nature. Hmm. Hmm. So That's not about worship yes, and also from uh, the kind of uh, the preservation, the sustainable lifestyle mm -hmm. that uh, India had, yeah. probably I think that is how we've been able to maintain this kind of uh, diversity that we have. Yeah. See, one of the but are we maintaining that diversity? Because if the other flip side of this uh, argument also is, uh, look at the way, uh, Aparna, your organization works with snake charmers. They work mm -hmm. with monkey uh, dancers and troops, yes. which actually hold Kalandars. monkey kalandars, which are the yeah. bear dancers. Can you tell us a little bit about them as well? Because that's the other side of it, that uh, animals being used to earn yes. livelihood yes. by people. Yes. So um, this is one of our most beautiful projects. Um, this project was started um, because we uh, came across dancing bears, bears being danced, especially if you went 20 years ago, if you went towards Agra near uh, the Taj Mahal, all along the way towards Fatehpur Sikri, you would see bears being danced on the sides of the road mm. and a lot of tourists stopping to watch them dance and uh, the pay them the, money. Yeah, and pay money. Uh, that when, uh, it's to, when we saw the condition of those bears that this project actually originated, the, the bears, uh, this was a relevant uh, kind of uh, entertainment in the Mughal era. That's mm -hmm. when this kind of was patronized by mm -hmm. the Mughals. And gradually with time, with the kind of media and entertainment we have today, they began to get irrelevant. But that community, the Kalandar community itself is a nomadic tribe. They are poor and they don't know or have an alternate uh, vocation. So 
we realized that if you took away the bear from them, they would just go back and get another bear from the forest through the poachers. So it, we had to, uh, we saw this as a great opportunity to rehabilitate not just the animal, but also the person or the tribe or the... Yes, animal. yes, that's, that's been seen as one of the pilot projects. Yes, yeah, Ravish, yeah, you yeah. have a point too. No, no, I was just saying that I think it's a very important point what she made. It's when we talk about conservation, we'll waste try to say solution or make an awareness and things like that. Unless you get into the bottom of things, why people are doing this? Hmm. If you don't address the livelihood problem or even aspirations, so it's not just only livelihood, even I want to become richer. So that is also an aspiration that genuinely need to be looked into. So unless you go into this kind of an economic solution, wildlife conservation will not be your only lift service. But, but Latika, you actually have a very interesting model that you tried in central India at uh, Kana Reserve Park as well, where you worked with locals. How responsive are they to the idea of uh, coexisting and uh, working uh, for uh, looking at alternative livelihood and looking at something like wildlife tourism, which can help them also generate more revenue? I think um, people are very open to uh, new ideas. It's not just Central India, I think all over the world um, and especially in many places in India we've seen how tourism and perceptible economic benefit can turn perceptions around about wildlife from being a threat to being an asset mm -hmm. and something that they would want to keep around them. And I think a case in point is what is happening with snow leopards. It's happened with birds in several regions. Um, now the, the leopard conservation status um, in and around Bera in uh, Rajasthan. Which is Western India? Yes, which is yes. Western India. Um, there's, um, you know, a whole uh, lot of bird areas where uh, people have really come forward uh, to help with bird conservation because they benefit uh, from... Uh, photography and uh, guano enriching the fields. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's just a matter of earning the trust of the people and, and being able to introduce them to an idea and showing them by example. Well, Ramesh, I know you want to say something. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. I, mean, I just uh, wanted to actually kind of uh, put certain things in perspective. See, when we talk about this pile of conservation issues, one of the fundamental things that we need to keep in mind is we need to maintain the common species common. Mm -hmm. So mostly what we are doing is we are firefighting because we don't have this kind of luxury maybe, or we are focused mostly on the endangered species or ash species. So while we are spending so much money and energy, and we're losing out common species, mm. and they also become rare. So I think we need to have a really Which clear... Which is actually a very important yeah. point, because why to wait till the 11th hour? Exactly. Why not start now? And exactly for that, I want to actually take you through this amazing story. Out of the three Indian species on the global list for the international protection under the UN Convention, two are birds. A recent study by eBird, a biodiversity-related citizen science project, found that the Indian bird population is in severe decline. So what can be done? I met bird conservationist Nintaneja in Delhi to find out. A rare sound in the congested residential area in Delhi. As the population of birds decline, these calls are getting fewer in the city. Rapid urbanization is threatening their natural habitat. You, and this is just my and 51 year old Nintaneja is trying to do her bit to save them. She has invested in a bird corner at her home. Um, flowers to attract the birds, the sunbirds. Um, there's some fruit feeders, some grain. There are wooden nest boxes to shelter them and she even keeps fruits like papaya to attract birds. So my love for birds started basically when I was about six, seven years back. And I, uh, it was like I wanted to de-stress over some issues that I was going through. And I would sit in my balcony for hours just looking outside and then little by little I started observing the birds coming in. I would put fresh water for them every day. They put a whole lot of a meaning in my artwork and my life. For Nim's regular bird class with children where she takes a quiz and a painting session to help them understand the importance of birds in the ecosystem. Ten-year-old Kunal is excited to learn more and tells me why he wants to save his favorite bird. Uh, the more, my most favorite bird is like the Orient white eye. I like it because it's very small and pure and it has a white patch on its eye. 
we should save wood because um, they ha they bring balance in nature and they also deserve to uh, live lives like us but this is a small step according to a recent study nearly a hundred bird species are at high risk in India alone and effective conservation policies are needed before they vanish from our memories too so we need them we need them in this world we need them to coexist with us uh, Latika what's been your experience about the gen next are they also uh, very excited to talk about wildlife or are they also saying oh we haven't liked this boy that I met he said that uh, it's been a while that I've seen a sparrow and the only way he can he knows about a sparrow is because he's seen a picture yeah Divina you know it's a it's a strange mix I have a one section of the youth who are very aware of what is happening and I have another section that's so interested only in technology and city life that they have an absolute disconnect from what is happening in nature. Hmm. Latika, I think yes, I, need to, I need to say this because now if you look at the kind, the kind of trend that we have even in the forest service and department a lot of young people are coming with uh, good qualification yes. so therefore I think the technology is going to be the right uh, situation now earlier on maybe even if the technology was there it was not getting integrated mm -hmm. now there is an opportunity therefore I mean as you rightly said there are kind of people who are being wanting to be in the field the others who like to use the technology I think we are in a good position. So, well, let me also add in this. The study which has been done by eBird is actually yes. an app-based study. If you spot a bird, just put it in, and that's how it's sort of a yeah, citizen I database. You know, yes, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead I also on. think uh, this is my take. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people want to do a lot of things. And there are a lot of people who want to help. Mm -hmm. But many people don't know how. Uh, a, because they don't have uh, a lot of awareness about it. And two, maybe they don't have a support um, group. Sure, sure. But as as Ramesh said about technology, I think uh, one of your campaigns also is about spreading awareness about yeah. elephants. Now, yes. elephants have a have a very different uh, uh, place in Indian society. Um, in Hindu religion, they're worshipped. Uh, they also have this image of uh, being royal and part of a grand festival. So on uh, weddings or important functions, you'll see elephants, and people would li like to ride them. Uh, but social media has played a key role, hasn't it? For for it your has. organization, yes. especially in Western India, to raise a campaign about not to write them. If people say no, yeah. we can say so yes. yeah. yeah. Go ahead. About we have yeah. this campaign called Refuse to Write. Mm -hmm. uh, this is especially true even in big places like Fort, mm -hmm. uh, which is where this kind of campaign originated because you have elephants walking up a uh, you know the fort uh, uh, the whole day carrying uh, tourists mm. uh, and uh, so we wanted to bring ac uh, across you know the awareness to tell people that don't don't ride these elephants refuse to ride them mm -hmm. the, you know just kill the business because uh, these b elephants were really going through you know so much of uh, torture there is also the snakes um, similarly mm. we have a snake uh, campaign uh, in Delhi okay. where we have a round the clock helpline okay uh, this helpline has been really great because the number of people who now call us round the clock, we get calls uh, up to 100 uh, snake calls in one monsoon season. But what happens after you capture the snake? I mean, how do you ensure that uh, you're able to safely uh, uh, leave the snake back in the forest where it doesn't disturb uh, the human population so and it's not of, also yeah. under threat? So we have a wonderful team of veterinarians and uh, people, handlers, okay. who are many of them, uh, you know, rehabilitated from the very community which uh, abuses them. Uh, like the Madaris or the Kalandars. We have People who used to capture who them to earlier capture to them. earn a living. and yes, uh, because uh, we found that they can handle them so well. They already know the animals. So that could uh, be perhaps one solution. But Ramesh, you were earlier talking about technology as well. And one of the uh, pet projects in India, and Latika has been talking about this as well, is the tiger project. We've seen the number of tiger now 3,000, uh, according to the latest official data, and significantly up uh, from a point where they were dwindling. Um, how has technology been used? used in that project to protect Before that, I would like yes, to take yes, it yes. from what she said about okay. this and then connect to the e-birds. Sure. I was fortunate to be in that the particular meeting in COP. So where, when they talked about, initially it was just, uh, when you talked about how do we kind of make people aware. I think this is a one way you can bring citizens mm -hmm. to contribute and kind of institutionalize it. I think one of the biggest problem is 
they, how do you make people aware and how do you bring information together? So that is where technology comes in. The eBird is nothing but uh, a combination of field level data yes. collection and yes. technology. Yes. So people have been able to put together. Yes. So even if you look at the state of bird report that they published, they've been able to kind of demonstrate how the decline has taken absolutely, place. Absolutely. And talking about Tiger, I think Tiger research, I think Latika started, and in fact I still remember as a researcher when I came to ILF Institute, she was showing this camera trap picture first time. So I think uh, if we started with the camera trap and the telemetry, this is now the telemetry and camera trap become very, very important tool in terms of Tiger management. Now recently the government has also come up with the National Tiger Conservation Authority and the Wildlife Institute mm -hmm. to come up with the software m which is basically a monitoring tool. I think there's multiple technologies come. In fact, I myself have been involved in one of our projects along with the National Tiger Conservation Authority is about implementing in the surveillance tool through drone. And drone surveillance so tool and heat mapping. Absolutely. But, but uh, Latika, tell me one thing. You were the pioneer to say in India with mm -hmm. first sort of research project in Tigers. But uh, where do you see our policies not being effective? Where do we need to do more? I think um, the sad thing in India is that wildlife conservation is not an absolutely integral part of every development plan. Mm -hmm. We have some basic clearances that we feel that we have to get for a plan, but we don't think of it in the long term as something that's a integral component of the plan and that's where we fall short mm. we have all the rules we have all the legislation we have all the the will to you know have all of this but we just fall back on that and i think a case in point would be like i was talking about earlier in delhi if you have a crowded crossing you would make an elevated road mm -hmm. over it if you did the same elevated road for every road that entered a protected area or a, a key forest area, you would save so many yeah. animal deaths mm. because animals cross roads and there are road kills. Mm. But we never think about this. Mm. We think about mitigation strategies when the road kills begin to happen. Absolutely. So Ramesh, to according ahead. to you, what, what could be some solutions? You also deal with policy makers on a regular basis. You've seen the Wildlife Protection Act in India in 1972, uh, where the national bird pickock, at least the numbers have gone up because of the strong uh, act and strong deterrent uh, against killing of peacocks. Where do you think we can help the other animals before, as you said, from common they become extinct? Sometimes the number increasing could also be a negative uh, sign. It's not always the population increase is a good sign. Sometimes when a habitat is getting a kind of suboptimal, mm -hmm. then you tend to have higher concentration. That's also one of the... It's yeah, not always absolutely, good. because 5% is the only uh, conservation area right now in India for That's what Indian people are looking at it, but I yeah. think if you look at the forest area, we have a lot more. Mm -hmm. So even if you look at the recent uh, on what the tiger number that you talked about, so we're talking about 8 9,000 square kilometers is what area they have been mm -hmm. able to see. But coming back to the kind of solution what Latika was also saying about the plan, I would like to make it more clear. I think India probably needs a land use policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, which could be implemented. So having a policy is one thing and implementing is a thing, but obviously India has been an excellent country in terms of bringing the concept. I, I would say that if you look at okay. the globally, I would say globally if you compare with Europe and things like that, India has done good, quite well. In fact, I keep telling to my colleagues and some others, even for the managers, if somebody can manage wildlife or manage conservation in India, I, they can manage anywhere in the world. <laughs> okay, yes, Aparna, last, yes, yeah. la last word to you then. Sorry. Okay, Latika, you and then Aparna. We have to remember that wildlife doesn't just live in the 5%. Mm. Exactly. We have wildlife all over all the country. Over. Yeah. And every day in our lives, we'll see something connected. Absolutely. Aparna, and that's what yeah. you witness on a daily basis, five Correct. calls a day. Yeah, so quickly a solution. Yeah. So uh, I think prevention is better than cure, and it applies to this as well. We have great laws, but uh, this ha the enforcement and implementation of these laws are uh, to be uh, really improved. Okay. Um, and okay. Uh, awareness and uh, sensitization of the public, uh, demand of uh, wildlife, uh, uh, you know, the wildlife articles. We need to address Absolutely. where this demand is coming from. Absolutely. So, uh, so more awareness. And also, yes. I think we often forget that wildlife is not just the big cats, the bears, the tigers. The Absolutely. I think the wildlife begins with the bee. Bee. <laughs> so what is that? Uh, the, I think, therefore, uh, chemical farming is the first thing we should do. So, string of, string of reasons, and we need Correct. to act Thank now. Thank you all so yes. much. I'm completely out of time. But thank you for joining us. Only when our world is together can we survive and thrive. Thank you for joining us on this call.
वर्क लाइफ इंडिया इज स्पॉन्सर्ड बाय नेक्सॉन ईवी क्राइड द लाइटनिंग